The number one biomechanical misconception I see when it comes to squat form and squat depth is that ankle mobility is the most important thing and better ankle mobility will always equal better squat depth. Let's break down the biomechanics of a squat so this makes a little bit more sense. I'm gonna break it up into three main phases of hip flexion or how much bend is in your hips. The first one is zero to 60 degrees of hip flexion. The next one is 60 to 100 degrees and then beyond that. When we're standing tall in a squat, we are in more of this hip extended position, which is this internally rotated position of the hip. So we have this closed pack position of the pelvis. Once we start to descend into a squat, we're going to have these anomena bones right here flare outward as the sacrum tips back. This is a movement where the innominant bone is moving on the sacrum and we're moving into external rotation like that. That allows us to find our heel better so that we can load our foot as we go down. This is what we refer to as a relative motion. This sacrum bone tipping back is going to require these bones coming relatively more forward to accommodate for that or else we would just fall back and lose our foot on the ground and fall on our butt. This allows us to keep our center of gravity evenly distributed throughout our foot, ideally a little bit more on our heels as we go down. At the level of the foot in this zero to 60 degree of hip flexion zone, the shin is going to be more externally rotated, the foot's going to be more supinated. From about 60 to 90 to 100 degrees of hip flexion, we are going to move from a position of external rotation, sacral counter nutation, to internal rotation, which is nutation of the sacrum where it comes forward. And these bones are going to rotate back to accommodate the sacrum bone coming forward. And these femurs will have more room to internally rotate alongside that. As we get to this 60 to 100 degrees of hip flexion zone, the foot is transitioning into an internally rotated or more pronated position, which is necessary. This foot needs to drop, this arch needs to lower for us to have more dorsiflexion or what people would refer to as ankle mobility in many cases. The most amount of dorsiflexion that we need coupled with that pronation is occurring around 90 degrees of hip flexion or parallel in terms of your thigh and the floor. This is where problems begin to arise for many people because a lot of people are missing internal rotation. A really easy way for people to find this internal rotation that they don't have would be to shove their knees outside of their toes, which a lot of people think is external rotation and abduction, but in reality, because the foot is fixated to the ground, this is internal rotation occurring up the chain at our femurs, which allows them to essentially do this to find room in our pelvis to find that necessary internal rotation. Beyond 90 to about 100-ish degrees, and I say ish because there are differences in pelvic shapes which can influence what degrees these happen at, but this is a general rule. So what happens is we need to re-externally rotate and we need the sacrum, which is going to now move on the innominate bones as opposed to the innominate bones moving on the sacrum to tip it back into external rotation. It depends on how the squat is loaded and also the individual's body structure, how much this is going to occur. But usually what we see is that the knees do move back because the foot is going into more supination again, and this shin is going to externally rotate. Now let's think about how there can be some issues here that we see all the time. If I'm in this internally rotated position of my pelvis and I need to tip this sacrum back and go into external rotation and counter mutation, and I can't do that, I can't move from here to here, then what am I gonna do? I'm just going to roll my pelvis underneath me as one unit. And did you see what happened there as I did that? I can get deeper into hip flexion, but there's nothing going on in here. This is just orienting my pelvis underneath me and this is a butt wink. On the way up now, what we commonly see is people overly arch their low backs or their feet collapse in, or you see the knees collapse in. This happens for a couple of different reasons, but a big one would be this pelvis cannot access internal rotation, nutation genuinely. And I know that I'm moving this pelvis all over the place. It's just for visual demonstration purposes. Really, the pelvis does not move this much. I'm just exaggerating it so you can see it. If I can't find the ability to nutate the sacrum and internally rotate these bones and femurs, it's very easy for me to just 
push my low back further forward, which orients my pelvis into this position of internal rotation. Regardless of what's going on in here, if I simply orient my pelvis forward, these femurs have room for internal rotation to put force into the ground to go through that squat. This happens mostly because a lot of people are stuck in this anterior forward orientation of the pelvis. So we want to start with exercises that will help bring it back, give us a little bit more hip extension, and then we can start to do things a little bit more dynamically. Here's an exercise I really like for getting more hip extension on one side and better genuine hip flexion on the other side. So to set up for this, we want to be in about a 90-90 position, meaning a 90 degree bend at both our hips and our knees. Now, Trevor, what I want you to do is I want you to give me a nice exhale feeling your whole foot flat on that wall as you dig down on that wall with your heels and you're gonna create a little bit of a tuck as you lift your hips slightly off the ground, the tuck should come from the hamstrings, not because we're trying to crunch down excessively. Good. Now what I want you to do is pull this leg back. Good. You should not feel a pinch in the hip, only as far back as you can get without feeling a pinch. Now reach this arm towards the ceiling and this arm overhead at about 140-ish degrees. And then what I want you to do is I want you to give me a nice exhale. Every exhale you do, you're trying to bring this leg back a little bit more and get your hips slightly higher in the air. Now upon that exhale, I want him feeling the inner edge of his foot arch on this wall. That would be the knuckle of the big toe right here and the inner heel. That's going to give him pressure to push into the wall and dig down. And that should give him a good bit of glute max on this downside hip right here. And as he inhales, he's gonna keep reaching with this arm. And upon the next exhale, this leg's gonna come back a little bit further. These hips are gonna get slightly higher in the air, but he's not losing that contact of the ball of the big toe and also the heel on this wall. So as he gets higher and higher in the air with each subsequent exhale, he's feeling a good bit of that glute on this leg right here. He should feel no pinch on his hip flexor on this flex leg right here. If he does, he's probably coming back too far and needs to back off a little bit. That's going to be effective for many people, but it might not be all they need. But the general idea is you want to work into a position where you can then go through dynamic hip flexion. A bench supported lunge is going to be really great for this because it's going to work us in very deep levels of hip flexion. We need to use a bench where we are able to get into around 110 to 120 degrees of hip flexion pretty comfortably. The knee might not get down to the ground and that's totally okay, but we wanna make sure that we're supporting ourselves with some sort of PVC pipe. But it doesn't have to be this. You could use a rack or a door frame or whatever you can hold on to, so long as it's in the opposite side of the leg that is forward here. So starting in this bottom position here is probably a good idea. We want the knee directly underneath the hip and the back. And we also want to be able to comfortably get into some deep hip flexion right here. Again, you're looking for around 120-ish degrees at that bottom position. So we can just go ahead and stand up there. Keeping most of our weight on this front leg right here, we're gonna slightly tuck our hips and then we're gonna stay tall. And then Trevor will have you descend, staying heavy on that front leg. Inhaling through his nose on the way down, exhaling through his mouth on the way up, making sure he's keeping a good reach and support here with the opposite side arm. A slow, controlled, full squat with a front anterior load is going to allow us to keep our rib cage stacked over our pelvis so that it can access those relative movements without needing to go into an orientation is going to be really great here. We're also going to elevate the heels. The reason why is because think about what this looks like. This is a position of external rotation of this tibia right here. The foot is in more of a supinated state. And also we're going to be in more plantar flexion, which is this movement right here. That's the opposite of dorsiflexion so that we can move in and out of external to internal rotation back to external rotation. That's why pretty much everyone benefits from heel elevation in a squat as it relates to squat depth because this is a position that allows us to access more external rotation and those joint actions from the ground up that's going to allow us to access more of that counter nutation at our pelvis. And Trevor, what I want you to do is keep your toes straight ahead, feet hip width apart, and now I want you to slightly bend your knees. Very nice. 
So he's gonna feel a lot of his weight in his heels here, but his whole foot is flat. The first step is to get a stacked position of the rib cage over the pelvis. So what I want you to do is keep that weight close, but reach those elbows forward, 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 and that's going to allow him to get this nice rib cage retraction here. But as he does that, he should not lose any height in his skeleton. And then do a very, very slight hip tuck. So now his pelvis is like a bowl of water that's parallel with the floor. It's very important when we get that reach to not let that weight go too far out in front. I like to keep it close to the chest, but reach the elbows forward. That will allow you to get this feeling. If you're slouching, that's not what we're looking for here. Now, what we want to do is exhale through our mouth fully and gently as we descend down. Knees going forward first, weight is in the heels. Get all the way down, staying nice and tall, keeping that rib cage retraction. Full inhale and exhale back up. Again, keeping your whole foot flat weight is mostly in the heels. Some people also benefit from getting in a deep squat and shifting their body weight from side to side to help loosen up some of those muscles that can get tight and restrict our ability to do this at the bottom. Try doing those three exercises in that order prior to squatting, whether it's with your body weight or loaded, and see how you feel.